from around the globe. It's the Q with digital coverage of DockerCon Live 2020. Brought to you by Docker and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone to the DockerCon 2020, hashtag DockerCon 20. This is the Cube virtual coverage with Docker on their event here. Uh, we're in studio in Palo Alto. I'm John Furrier, your host of the Cube. We're here with a great guest to talk about Docker, desktop, the Microsoft relationship and the key news that's coming out. Ben Desson Pergach is the product manager uh, for Docker Desktop. Uh, ben, great for coming on. Thanks for uh, spending the time with me. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. So obviously, um, this is a virtual conference. We wish we could be in person, but you know, given the state of affairs, we're going to do remotely. But the momentum Docker has is phenomenal. It's always been great with containers. It's the number one downloaded, you know, app around for developers. Um, uh, Microsoft just had their build conference, which was again virtual as well or digital, as they say, it's interchangeable. Um, but clear momentum now with Docker as containers actually is the standard. You guys are doing great. What's the key news out of, out of the Microsoft world? Um, uh, people missed it last week with MS Build. Yeah, so last year at Build, Microsoft announced WSR2, so Windows Subsystem for Linux 2. The original Windows Subsystem for Linux sort of gave a mapping between the Windows kernel and the Linux kernel, um, which worked reasonably well, but it just didn't provide the same, the same sort of native Linux experience. Last year, they announced Windows Subsystem for Linux 2. WSR2 provides an actual Linux kernel on, on the Windows machine. And we've been working hard with Microsoft over the last year to integrate Docker Desktop, the main desktop application for, for working with containers, with WSL2. Um, at Build this year, Microsoft have gone on and announced that WSL2 is going to have a few new features. Um, so it's going to have, a, eventually it'll have graphical Linux applications, you've got access to the file system. Um, the installation is going to become a lot slicker, which I guess as a PM, I'm quite excited about that bit. Um, the most exciting announcement is that they will be bringing uh, GPU support to WSL2, which means that we'll be able to provide GPU support through Docker Desk for, for container workloads for people sort of working on on ML or machine learning or AI work through through containers on Docker Desktop for Windows, which is really cool because we've never been able to do that before. So this is this the first GPU support on Microsoft Windows? For Docker with Docker, it's it's yeah, it's the first GPU support for Docker Desktop on Mac or Windows. So previously, the hypervisor hasn't passed through um, the the GPU pretty much, which meant that we couldn't access it from yeah. from Docker Desktop. So Docker Desktop is sort of a, a lightweight VM that runs a Docker engine. We sort of pump all that in for you, um, but we're limited by what we get get access to from the hypervisor. Now Microsoft are running this through and giving us access for the first time. We can actually we can have a go. Not to go on a side tangent here, but you know, there's all these virtual events and I was watching some of the build stuff as well, as well as us media streamers and doing stuff. You can see people's home rigs and you talk to any developer, video streamer or anyone who's working remotely. If you don't have the best GPUs in there, I mean, this has just become I mean, quite frankly, you need the GPU. So this is important. It's not only from a vanity standpoint, performance, um, having that support, I'm going to want the best GPUs. I'm always going to be upgrading my machine for that extra power. What's the impact? What does it mean for me as a developer? Does it increase stuff? What's the, what's, what's the bottom line? As, as a developer, it means you actually have access to it. So uh, traditionally when you're doing workloads on the CPU, you've got minimum amount of parallelization you can do. When you're running workloads for an L development, you want sort of, um, you have a lot of parallel processing going on to, to do your, your model training. So in, a, in an ML development cycle, you're likely to have um, uh, uh, sort of a, your application, which you're going to use to produce your model and you're going to have training data. Taking that training data and producing your model requires lots of parallel processing, which is taking all of those calculations and doing them, produce the different final weightings. Um, Doing that on a CPU has to be done in a serial fashion rather than parallel, which is hugely resource intensive and takes a really long time. Whereas on a GPU, you can do all of that in parallel, which massively reduces the amount of time it'll take to sort of run those training functions, um, either just straight up in Linux or running them in a container, which as a lot of people are looking at running containerized workloads, um, it's how I first, the, the first team that I was on that actually used Docker, I was working, um, in Amazon on Alexa, and my team picked up Docker doing some of our ML workloads there. And that was my first experience. So even though my team back now will be excited to see this. 
Yeah, I mean, ML workloads, automation is going to be critical of that performance. Okay, let's get into some of the momentum with Microsoft. You guys have, obviously, um, builds over. We're here now at DockerCon. There's news. Could you share some of the, the tidbits for kind of what's, what's being talked about now with Docker and DockerCon? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, along with uh, along with everything else we've been doing, we we've been partnering with Microsoft to try and make the best the best experience generally with Docker Desktop and with WSL2 and with VS Code. Um, so, we've been working closely with Microsoft guys to actually try and improve our our experience on Windows as it is today, and to improve. Um, some of those integrations with VS Code as well. So working with the VS Code team on the, the Docker plugin for VS Code to, make, to give our feedback and to hear feedback from those guys on the, the errors and the issues they're seeing with people with Docker Desktop and to really try and produce the best the best experience we can on Windows. Um, end to end from going from sort of local running all the way through to actually trying to do that first push, that first run on the cloud using, using Docker. So what are some of the new product management processes and customer support things that you guys are doing? This comes up a lot, obviously, you know, we had a great conversation around shifting left um, with security, that's great news there. You start to see a lot of this added value for developers, one of them support, right? So how do I get, you know, things I need? And from a customer standpoint, you know, there's a lot of, it's a kind of a moving train in this world I mean, it's getting only better and better uh, from a developer standpoint but there's more complexity that's got to be abstracted away. You got, you know, this new abstraction layers developing, you got automation. How does the customer get the support they need in the same agile way that developers are cranking out code? It's a really good question. It's something I think we're still working on as well. So we're at the moment trying to work out, one of the big things I'm trying to work out is how do we make it easier for people to get started with Docker? And how do we also make sure with the things we build, we don't sort of leave a, uh, a cliff edge instead of the learning path. You don't get to a certain point in an easy process and then the next step, take, step takes you straight off a cliff. So that's not useful for anyone. Um, so producing those paths and those ways for people to learn and actually progress is something we're really trying to work out how to make it natural to go from your first experience all the way through. Um, from an actual support perspective, the other thing we're looking at to functionally support people is we're trying to do more things in the open. We're really trying with Docker to bring as many of the new features and pieces we're developing. We're trying to actually do that in the open with community visibility so that if people really want it fixed, they can they can open a PR and they can help us as well. Um, uh, the last thing that uh, my team released for that was our uh, Docker GitHub Actions. Um, and it's great as we had someone raised an issue, could you do this? Someone else opened a PR and we merged it. So to a certain extent, you sort of got one side, which is how do you onboard in this ever growing sprawl and keep learning. The other side is how do you fix forward when you find an issue. And that one, we're, we're really trying to work with the community a lot more than we have sort of over the last couple of years. Awesome, so the folks watching, hit him up on Twitter. Uh, he's the product manager for Docker Desktop, among other things. Uh, oh, you guys are very transparent, so you got your Twitter handle on the lower third. People can can chime in, or just jump on the chat. We'll we'll follow up and get you the info. Final question for you, Ben. Um, as you look at this reality we're in, you know, there's kind of a holistic kind of moment now where people are kind of realizing the new realities here. You're looking at the you get the keys to the kingdom with Docker Desktop. Okay, you got some momentum with Microsoft. The, the, the developer roles moving fast and fast as the headroom increases for capabilities with automation and ML, you mentioned a few of those things, GPUs now available. What's the future look like for these developers, the next short, medium, long term? What's your view as you look out over the landscape? Because you got to look at the product roadmap, you're engaging with the community. Can you share some insight into how you're thinking about Docker desktop going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think we're at a really interesting point, as you say, which is that if you look at sort of a lot of the, the the developer surveys that have sort of come out over the last the last like six months, six to eighteen months, um, the things like CI/CD are gaining momentum. Things like orchestration for containers are gaining momentum. And we're kind of, if you think about like crossing the chasm model, we're we're just past the early adopters now. We're kind of into the early majority, and we're going to start to move over the next few years into the late majority. What that really means is that people may have been using one or two of these technologies, 
maybe you've been um, using cloud, maybe you've been using um, edge, maybe you've been using containers, maybe you've been using CI CD, maybe you are using orchestration, maybe you're not, maybe you've got a microservice application, maybe it's still a bit of a mole. Um, what we're really going to see is we're going to start to see all of these changes intersecting and overlapping. And people who are picking up one or two of these will start to pick up all of them. And that's probably going to happen as we move into sort of the majority of users. So from a, a what's coming, it's sort of the, a lot of those things that you sort of see the best practice and the ideal um, developer setups with a beautiful CI, CD, going to an orchestrated environment um, with a microservice architecture, we're going to see a lot more of that becoming becoming the norm. But I think along with that, we'll also see a level of recognition coming along that a single microservice alone doesn't provide value and that it's going to be sort of those groups of services that can provide the user outcome. And that's where I'm quite focused as a PM, which is, you know, a, an authentication service is great, but it doesn't provide value unless you can get access to something off, off your authentication. It's been interesting, the new, Docker, the, the new Docker yeah. is all about developer experience. This is really the core mission. I mean, since the, the sale of the piece of Mirantis, Docker has retrenched and reinvented, but stayed core to its principles. What, just share with the developers who will be watching that are, are coming back into the ecosystem. What is this new Docker vibe? Share your thoughts. The new Docker vibe is, is about working in the open and it's about solving problems for developers. The original goal of Docker was to make it easy to package and ship code. It was to reduce developer friction. Um, as we move more into sort of the enterprise space, we worry more about ops and DevOps. We're now trying to refocus on developer. I and mean, if you sort of think of two parts of the developer life cycle, where you've got your work, where you're doing your creative work, where you're writing code, and then you've sort of got your part of the work, which is sort of your inner loop. And then you've got your part where you're trying to get that code out to production, where you're trying to get your value to someone else. Um, instead of your outer loop, we're really trying to focus on, on the inner loop. And sort of our mantra is that any, for a developer should spend as much of their time as possible creating new and exciting things. And we want to produce tools that reduce some of those boring, mundane, repetitive tasks. So we're really trying to work out how do we make how do we take those boring repetitive pieces? And how do we make them just vanish like magic for new users? Or how do we reduce the friction for really experienced users um, from, from both desktop and hub and really try to bring those two together to, to achieve that? You know, it's great about, you know, folks who have been in the cloud since day one, all of us who have the start tissue experiences. You know, the one thing that's constant is constant change. And one of the things that you guys have done at Docker and hats off to the whole, you know, original team is that that brand of Docker has symbolized, you know, quality openness and set the standard. I mean, if you look back, uh, you know, when containers were really coming around, it's not a new concept, but Docker really set the industry on this path. And, you know, we're, you know, been great to follow every Docker con with the cube coverage, but more importantly, as the demand for developers to build these next wave of Cambrian explosion of applications, it's going to be, um, more important than ever to have more of these abstractions, more of these, the tooling that's real time, more developers uh, experience because there's more building going on. And it's not yeah, just I one cloud, it's all clouds, it's all things. Yeah, I think it was in like an IDC analyzed the future report a couple of years ago, I think it was maybe 2018 one. They said that sort of maybe 2017, they said to date we have built sort of 500 million applications worldwide and by 2023 we've built another 500 million. So we, you know, the the rate of creation is just insane. It's this exponential growth of us producing more and more applications and connecting more and more devices to them. Um, so yeah, we the the sheer volume of creation and the rate of new technologies supporting that, um, and even the the rate of companies adopting, I guess more than one cloud. I think it's like um, like sixty percent of companies are now more than one cloud provider. Um, maybe even more, maybe something like eighty percent. Like it's 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 ridiculous. How I was just having this people. debate on Twitter about this multi-cloud. Someone tried to call us out and say, "Oh, you guys were pooing on poo-pooing on multi-cloud in 2016, 18." I go, I go, look at no one was poo-pooing on multi-cloud. It didn't exist. I had multiple clouds, but there was no real use case. Now you're starting to see the use cases where, yeah, I have multiple clouds. You know, I got Azure here. I got this over here. 
but, but no one wakes up and spreads their workloads around. This is going back a few years. Certainly the hybrid was developing, but I think now you're yeah. starting to see with networking and some of these interoperable dynamics, you're starting to see innovation pockets and white spaces and large, large market opportunities for startups and companies to thread the clouds together at the right place. So I think multi-cloud is becoming apparent from a use case standpoint. Still a ton of work to do. I mean, Direct Connect's got SLAs. I mean, all kinds of stuff at the networking level, but um, it is real. I mean, it's going to be one of those realities that everyone has at least one or two, if not three. It'll be optimization. This is what developers do, right? <laughs> Solve problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if nothing else, I've, I've encountered a couple of companies where even just, um, Redundancy is handled by a multi-cloud strategy. Yeah. If you want to achieve more nines, then you just balance your workload between two clouds. I mean, the Zoom news was really a testament to that because you know everyone got uh, got into a twist over that. Oh, Zoom moved off Amazon. No, they didn't move off Amazon. They went to Oracle. They got Azure. They got they're everywhere. Why wouldn't they be? They need capacity. They need failover. They need fault tolerance. I mean, these are basic direct distributed computing concepts that you know is one on one. You got to have you know, these co-locations and optimization for those clouds and the apps on at Microsoft as well. So why wouldn't you do it? Exactly. And that's that, that hybrid, that multi-cloud, compounding that with sort of, as I said earlier, the, all the changes when you're looking at how you go to CICD, how you're bundling these applications, creating more applications than ever. Um, and coming back to sort of with more AI workloads as we discussed around GPU, and you combine that with sort of the last topic we already really touched on, which is like ARM and the growth of edge devices as well. Um, it sort of makes for a really interesting future. And Docker is sort of, we, that that summation is sort of the, what we're using to frame how we're thinking about the future of our product and what we should be building. Great, for the audience out there, hit them up on Twitter, Ben's available, they're out in the open. If you're interested in how Docker makes life easier on the Windows platform uh, with the GPU support, you got security now built in, shifting left. Give these guys a call. And of course, we love the mission out in the open. It's the Cube's mission as well. And great to chat with you. Ben, thanks for spending the time with me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, it's the Cube's coverage, virtual Cube with DockerCon co-creating together out in the open, DockerCon 20, hashtag Docker 20. I'm John Furrier with the Cube. Stay tuned for our next segment and thanks for watching.